from the book of Luke. And um, the name of the sermon, <clears throat> first of all, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers around the world who you know Jesus. Happy Mother's Can we give a round of applause to the mothers? Happy Mother's Day. The sermon is called Mother's Reason to Rejoice. Because sometimes uh, mothers don't know that they have a reason to rejoice every single day of their lives. And so we're going to talk to them this morning. So men, I'm sorry, uh, you may get something out of this, but uh, this is for the mothers this morning. Are y'all okay with that, men? Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. I mean, uh, those who say no, I need the ushers to escort them to the door. Because this is a woman's day. This is y'all day this morning. Women, are y'all okay with that? Can we talk to you this morning? Amen. So uh, we're reading from Luke, um, Luke 1. And we're starting from verse 26. And um, who better to learn from about mothers than from the original mother of Jesus Christ? Can, can, can you learn? You think you can learn a few things from the mother of Jesus Christ? Uh, because she went through some stuff. And so we've got to talk about her so that you'll learn uh, that you're not the only one who's been through some things in life. And so we want to talk uh, to the mothers hearts this morning and give y'all a reason to rejoice uh, for every single thing. I know you may have had children that may have uh, went astray, that may have done certain things uh, uh, that may not be where you want them to be, but you have to know that this morning we're giving you a reason to rejoice in Jesus Christ. Uh, we're reading from uh, Luke 1, 26. We're starting from the 26th verse. And it's, it's talking about the birth of Jesus being foretold. And uh, it's speaking of Mary. And it's talking about Mary. And it's saying, in the sixth month, this is of, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, um, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth in town in Galilee. And remember, we talked about Galilee. We talked about Samari Samaritans, the Samaritans. And we talked about Jerusalem and, and um, um but today we're talking about Galilee, and it said God sent his, the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. It says the virgin's name was Mary. It says the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are, are highly favored. I want you to say you who are highly favored. You who are highly favored. It says, greetings, you who are highly favored. Now, the first thing it says about Mary is it says she is highly favored. Um, why does it say she's highly favored? She hasn't done anything special yet. Um, it wasn't saying she was highly uh, favored because her name was Mary. Because I'm sure there was tons of Marys at that time, Frank. I mean, if you know anything about Elizabeth, Elizabeth was the one who was going to give birth to John the Baptist. So Elizabeth was pregnant seven or uh, six months before Mary. And Elizabeth uh, was old, if you know anything about her. She was old. And she, for years, could not have a child. Uh, but she ended up getting pregnant with John the Baptist. And so Mary is highly favored. So you have to know, moms, why Mary was highly favored. It wasn't because she was married wasn't because she was a virgin. Um, it wasn't because of her upbringing. Her upbringing doesn't make her any closer to being highly favored because highly favored is a special thing. It wasn't because of her faithfulness in the Lord because there was a lot of women who were faithful in the Lord. Um, but the next part of the sentence says why she was highly favored. It says, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. So highly favored has nothing to do about with your standard in life, your stature in life, how much money you have, how many times you've been to church, how many times you've not been to church. Highly favored has everything to do with the Lord being with you. Can I get an amen this amen. morning? So Ephesians 1.4 talks about Mary. It says God chose you, and we're talking about Mary, you Mary in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in God's sight. And so that means that Mary was holy and blameless before Mary knew that she was highly favored. 
And so for, before Mary knew that she was highly favored, God chose her and God made her highly favored. And not only that, he made her holy and blameless in his sight. Now I know, women, that there are men of your past who may not look at you as holy and blameless. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. Is there, there are people in your past, friends and family members, who may not look at you as holy and blameless. There are people of the past who may not look at you as holy and blameless, but according to this word, Mary was holy and blameless before she took a step on this earth. And so, it goes further to say this, Mary was greatly troubled at the words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Why is this man of God, this angel of the Lord coming before me, telling me I am holy and blameless, or telling me that I am highly favored, representing holy and blameless? Why is this, is this angel coming before me telling me these things? Well, the first thing the angel says to her, it says, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. Now, Mary is thinking, I have not done anything different. I have not done anything special. Why did I, do, did I find favor with God? And I know sometimes you as women look at that and wonder, why do I find favor with God? And the angel said, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. Well, let's just stop it. You will conceive and give birth to a son. First of all, God said in Ephesians 1, 4, Paul says, God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And then it says here to Mary that she will conceive and uh, she has found favor with God and she will conceive and give birth to a son and she's to call him Jesus. But she's not done anything on this earth yet. She hasn't done anything special yet. Being a virgin is a normal thing of that time frame. And so for her to be blessed and highly favored, for her to not be afraid because of the words this, this angel of God is saying, for her to be told that she's going to conceive and have a child and that child is going to be special, is only of the Lord himself. And so let's read 32 and 33. 32 um, says this, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him a throne of his father David and he will reign over uh, Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Can everybody say never? Never. never. His kingdom will never end. Why? Because the kingdom is eternal. And guess what eternal means? It means before and after. It means forever. So if his kingdom is eternal, then children born of that same family afterwards are part of that eternal family. And so what does that mean? It means those who believe in Jesus Christ. What does that mean, mothers? It means that if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you fall in the same category that Mary falls in. And it makes you blessed and highly favored in everything you do. What does that mean? Does that mean you're going to have millions and millions of dollars? No, it doesn't mean you're going to have millions of millions. Does it mean you're going to have success in everything you do? No, it doesn't mean you're going to have success in everything you do. But what does it mean? It means that all things through Christ Jesus, you will have success in. And so Mary was highly favored with the Lord because the Lord was with her. The, the angel told her not to be troubled because she had favor with God. That favor had absolutely nothing to do with what she's done or what she will do, but it had everything to do with what God's plan was for her. And then 34 says this, 34, 30, um, well, 30, 34 says, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Well, 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 how is that special? Well, the Holy Spirit, I want you to write this down. The Holy Spirit will come and the power of God will overshadow you and to give birth to God's child. I want you to write that down. The Holy Spirit will come and the power of God will overshadow you 
to give birth to God's child. Now, we're going to keep on with this. It says in 36, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is already in her sixth month. Now, that's interesting, and that's exciting, but why is it important? Because this next statement applies to every single woman under the sound of my voice. Verse 37 says, for no word of God will ever fail. Did, did y'all hear that, women of God? It says, no word of God will ever fail. Meaning, Mary's words may fail. Her promises may not be kept. She may have told people things that she didn't do. She may have said, I'll, I'll talk to you later, never talk to that person again. She may have said things that were inappropriate to people. She may have done things that were inappropriate. She may have uh, done things in her past that she did not want to do, and if she could change them, she would change them. However, it says, no word of God will ever fail. What does that mean? In spite of what she did in her life, she was still blessed and highly favored of the Lord. In spite of all the bad things she's done, she was still blessed and highly favored of the Lord. In spite of all the things negative she may have said in her life, she was still favored of God. And I'm here to tell you this morning that all of you in here, if you showed up this morning, you are favored of God. Why is that? Not because of anything you have done, but because his word never, ever, ever fails. It always accomplishes. You say, well, I, I dwindled in and out of church, but you're here this morning. And so Mary gave birth to Jesus Christ. And at the age of 12 years old, Jesus, uh, the family, attended a festival and if you know anything about that they attended a festival every year to represent to, 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 to you know represent the Passover and to celebrate the Passover uh, that was when God showed favor on the Israelites and struck all the children the firstborn children of e uh, of Egypt down except the ones who had the Passover the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and so they're celebrating that. And Jesus is now 12 years old. And at 12 years old, um, he's with the family and he's starting to get some of that wisdom and understanding that he is a special child born in the flesh. And so even uh, though he's starting to learn this, you got to think, you know, as a mother, if you have a child who's the, 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 the child of God, the child of God, the father, but born through you, wouldn't it be difficult on how to take care of that child? Wouldn't it be difficult on uh, should you discipline that child if that child done wrong? Wouldn't it be dif uh, difficult on what to say to that child when the child does something inappropriate? Well, let me tell you what Mary did. So at the age of 12, they, they, Jesus and the family, they attend this festival. And Jesus wanders off. And not only does he wander off, but the family leaves. The family leaves. They leave to go back to Jerusalem. And when they left to go back to Jerusalem, guess what they were realized when they got home? That their 12-year-old wasn't with them. Can you imagine all of us as a family getting together and saying, hey, let's go somewhere. We all go somewhere. We have a joyous time. We celebrate the Passover. And now we're on the way back, walking back, or however we're going back. And on the way back, we realize, oh, man, somebody is not with us. Who's missing? They, wait. they got all the way home before they realized that Jesus wasn't with them. They didn't do a head count. But they realized Jesus wasn't with them. And so, <laughs> can you imagine a mother? Mothers, have you ever wondered where your child was before and then found out your child was somewhere? And then, then, but when you found out you were already mad, you're happy that you saw the child, but you want to knock the head off the child now that you find out they're all right. Can I get a hey man this morning? Have y'all ever felt that way before? Child's will be home at 6, get home at 6.30. You know they're always home at 6. And they don't show up. You're calling the neighbors. You're calling everybody else to find out where your child is. They didn't have phones. So they had to go all the way back to Jerusalem because they didn't find him. I mean, they had to go all the way back to, uh, to where they were to, to chase after him. They had to leave Jerusalem and walk all the way back to Galilee. <laughs> now think about that. 
Your child is not here. Imagine that walk. How would you feel in that walk if your child wasn't there? And so Jesus, <laughs> so they traveled back and they um, didn't locate Jesus immediately. They traveled back to, you know, to Jerusalem uh, and um, located him after three days. Did you, did you hear me? Three days. They located him after three days. There were two nights that that mom slept wondering where her child was, saying this is supposed to be the Lord, this is supposed to be the child of the Father, and he has disappeared. Is this part of God's will? The child has not been here for three days. And so they walked back and they found him, and even though his mother knew he was God's son, she still let him have it. Can you imagine your child after three days? Luke 2, 48 is where I'm reading from now. Luke 2, 48 says this. <laughs> she looked at him and she said, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, first of all, if my child did that, I don't know uh, what I would do in a situation like this. But uh, she, I know what a mom would do in a situation. I know what my mom would do in this situation. <laughs> um, and so, Luke 2.48, um, his mother said, I mean, she, she hasn't seen him in three days, and she finally finds him, and he's not uh, where he's supposed to be. And so he, they had to go back chasing after him, and it said when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Can you imagine what a mom's going to say to you after three days of disappearing? You're 12 years old. You're 12 year old son, moms. I can see your faces. All of y'all like this. I'm like, oh Lord, no. Mm -hmm. She said, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching, searching for you. Small note, I want to give y'all a small note. In the great family, <laughs> I would have gotten, uh, let's say, let's hypothetically speak and say I was a child of God. I was the son of God. And I disappeared for three days in the great household. I would have got a similar uh, chastise. But it would have been followed by a beatdown. I'm just talking about our family. You know, three days. One day I might get restriction. Three days there's a beat down. Child of God, son of God, I don't care who you are right now. You about to get disciplined. The Bible says spare the rod, spoil the child. So I'm going to use the rod to beat down the child. And so I'm just saying in the Gray household, I would have got a similar uh, chastise, but Mama Gray, uh, would have made me utilize as the child of God some of my early healings. <laughs> <laughs> the first laying of hands would have been a little different in your Bible. You ought to have been reading the Bible different. Jesus got beat down and then he had to lay hands on himself and recover uh, from his wound. I'm just telling my story. So uh, now here's the deal. No matter what Jesus' title was, even though he was God in the flesh, even though as God in the flesh, he was the chosen one of Israel. He wasn't too high and lifted up to be lowered and humbled by his mom. What I'm telling you is this. He listened to her even though she chastised him and said, where have you been? Who are you? Why did you do this to us? Why do you make us think this way and feel this way for three days? And so years later, Jesus is about to begin his public ministry um, and while attending a wedding where they ran out of wine, um, his mom said some, uh, some crucial words to him. Um, it, you got to understand how the social embarrassment is. When you're a family and you're having a wedding back then, they didn't have like options of different drinks. They only had wine and water. They didn't have like if Coke goes out, you can use Pepsi. They didn't have that. And so when the wine went out, that's like, oh no, you as a family don't have enough drink for all the people here? That's embarrassment. And so be, the, the, the family's supposed to be able to provide. And they ran out of wine. And 
Jesus, can you imagine Jesus just here at the celebrating with them and, and there with them? And can you imagine if that happened? And what it, the, the, the powerful thing about the whole thing is in 2-3, uh, the mom sees that there's no wine and she goes to Jesus and she looks at Jesus and she said, they have no more wine. And Jesus is like, and she's like, they have no more wine. Can you imagine? I know my child is God in the flesh. I know my child has certain powers and abilities. Son, he ain't got no more wine. Can you imagine? And Jesus is sitting here saying, woman, why are you bothering me right now? Can you, can you imagine? Mom, you know you would do that. My son has the abilities to do things. I'm not going to tell everybody about it. I'm going to look at my son and say, son, <laughs> They have no more wine. Are you going to let them be embarrassed? Or are you going to do some things? And, and Jesus looks at her and says, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not come yet. Now here's the thing. He's still God in the flesh. He says, My hour has not come yet. It is not my time. And then he goes forward and listens to his mom. Ask God. And so... So his mom tells him there's no more wine. And here's the thing. She didn't tell the servants, leave him alone, because he said, woman, uh, my time is not yet. Uh, it's not time for me to do these things. And he, uh, he didn't, she didn't look at the people and say, leave him alone or anything like that. She said, do whatever he tells you. Meaning, I spoke what was on my heart from the Father. I told my son, there's no more wine. That's all the father led me to say. From there on, I'm going to allow the father to do the work on the, his son. That's his son, so the father can do the work. But I did all that I was supposed to do, even though he told me back, it's not my time. And you know what happened after that? Jesus turned the water into wine when it wasn't his time. Amen? That means that his mom influenced him. His mom pushed him forward. Even though he knew that it wasn't his time at that moment, the father said, now it is your time. And then from there on, he listened to his mom. And so mothers have places in hearts that even God in the flesh listened to. So you got to know that even though you may say things and it seems like it doesn't work sometimes or they don't hear you sometimes, God always works on the hearts of men when they hear from their mothers or women when they hear from their mothers because a mother has a special place in the heart of God. Now, even though uh, this woman's actions through the Spirit pushed him forward, it pushed him forward because the, the Father worked on Jesus' heart from there. Now, to go to another sad note, when Jesus Christ was falsely arrested, his mom was there. When he was wrongfully beaten, his mom saw that. When he was wrongfully convicted and crucified, his mom was still there. She didn't turn away and say, I'm not going to watch my son go through prison. I'm not going to watch my son be, be beaten. I'm not going to watch my son be crucified. She was there with him even though he went through hard times. She saw him crying out. She saw him bleeding. She saw him bludgeoned when he didn't deserve it. But as a mother, she stood by her son and was there through his trial. She was right there by his side, even though she didn't want to see her child suffer. So how do you as mothers apply that now? How do you apply that to your lives now? How do you change? How does it make you different? You already have applied it to your lives and you don't even realize you applied it to your lives. Everything you do for your children out of the glory of God, out of the love of God, applies that to your life. Every time you get up and you pray for your child, that is the glory of God working through your heart. For something, even though you may not know what your child is going through, just praying for them. God is saying, I know what they're going through because I'm with them. 
So what is godly love? The ways of Mary to her son Jesus was godly love. And so now, as women, the most you can take from this is take lessons from the mother of God. I want you to write these things down. First, know that you are highly favored. The word of God says you are highly favored, not because of your accomplishments, but because the Lord chose you and he's with you. And so no matter what you see in your life, no matter what circumstance you go through, you've got to, 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 to trust that God is with you. You've got to trust that you are highly favored. No matter what anybody says about you, you've got to know at every standpoint you are highly favored. Why? Because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob chose you to be successful. Not just successful in life, but successful through Christ. Number two, I want you to write this down. You shouldn't be afraid of the words of God. Don't judge his promises according to you or others' conditions. Mary's son was still crucified. Mary was highly favored and had a child. Mary was blessed and had a child. Her child still died. Do you think that Mary having the child of God and not knowing all the details probably thought her son would live for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years? Do you think that Mary expected her child? If they told Mary when she was young and having the child, hey, your child is only going to live to be 22, 23, 32, 33 years old. You think Mary would be like, wait a minute. No, I want my child to live all longer than me. How many women out there want your children to live longer than you? When you're under the unction of the Holy Spirit and doing the work of God, you've got to trust that whatever God's plan is for you, as long as you're under his tutelage, as long as you're highly favored and walking in his light, then the glory of God is the only thing that matters. Life comes and life goes. The third thing you need to write down is no that no word from God ever fails. He said that Mary was highly favored. That means that you are highly favored also. Why? Because you are a child of God. You are a woman of God in the, in the, in the kingdom of God. And being in the kingdom of God, you have to continue to be who he says you are and not what others say you are. In our lives, you know, sometimes we spend our time trying to be who everybody else says we are instead of being who God says you are. Now, I'm talking to everybody in here. You have to learn how to be who God says you are. And God says you are highly favored. And he says, do not be afraid. Why? Because God will say good things about you. And I know some of you have been through life, the, 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 the deception in your life where people say things that are negative about you, say you'll never amount to anything, you'll never be successful. I'm here to tell you today, women, you are successful just for the fact that you have born or had a child and it was a child of God. The fourth thing is know that as a chosen mother, chosen mother from God, you were predestined by the Lord to be overshadowed by his spirit, to be fruitful and give birth, not just to a child, but to a child of the kingdom of God. When our parents, mothers, when y'all give birth to children, that is such a special thing. You cannot look at the accomplishments your children are have or have had or the failures that they have had and justify whether you're happy or whether you're sad. You should be excited in the Lord because one, if he chose you, he chose your children also. And so you have to have faith in what God has done for you and through you. The last thing is you want to be patient and know that your, 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 your labors are not in vain. You did not do things in vain. Your, your rebukes are not in vain. When you tell that child to, to not to do something, they still do it. It was not done in vain. Your chastise is not, it's not in vain. When you, when you put them, restrict them, when you uh, take things away from them, it's not in vain. As long as you do things in and of the Lord, you have to know that your sacrifice is never in vain. And we as children hear you when you say things to us. Now, uh, children, 
of mothers. I know that you don't always listen, and you act like you don't always listen. There are times you turn your head and say, oh, my mom needs to leave me alone. How many of you have said that before? Most people are not raising their hands. Uh, note that their mothers are next to them. Just want to make sure you know that. Uh, they like raising fingers. <laughs> he raised two hands because mommy here with him. <laughs> but you have to know that we as children hear you. And whether children are in prison or out of prison, whether they're rich or whether they're poor, whether you're, they're successful according to the world or successful according to God, we hear you and as family, we love our mothers. Now, I want to tell a story uh, to make sure everybody understands and understands what we're talking about here. Um, can I tell a story this morning? Is it okay that I tell you a story? Yes. There's a mom who gets up and, and gives her son a courtesy call. And she uh, gives her son a courtesy wake-up call uh, son, hey, this is you know this is Mother's Day. You need to go to church uh, this morning. So wake up, and her son is like, man, come on, Mom, I'm tired. I don't know. I don't feel like getting up. I, I know it's I know it's um, your day and all that. A uh, happy Mother's Day, but um, today I'm just not feeling it. I don't feel like anybody ever felt that before. Don't raise your hands. I'll tell the truth. Um, she said, son, you got to get up. Get up today. Come on, you got to get up and go to church. Get up. Come on, this is, this is the day. I, look, you can do one thing for me. Get up and go to church. And he looks at, he called, he's talking to his mom. And he says, mom, can you give me three reasons why I should get up this morning? Because I'm really not feeling it this morning. And she said, okay, I'll give you three reasons. And she says, one, because I'm your mom and it's Mother's Day. That's one. <laughs> Uh, two, just because by itself, I'm your mom. And three, because you are the pastor. <laughs> and so I'm telling you this for a reason, because you have to be able to know uh, that it goes through all areas. And as the pastor, the pastor should want to get up and go to church anyway. But this pastor was going to get up and say, Mom, I can't do it this morning. She's saying, look, son. You're the pastor of the church. You got to get up. So even as the pastor, the mom had to motivate the son. I'm telling you, moms, you do great things with your children. And the little things you do mean a lot. And you have to know uh, that the most important thing is to rejoice because your children are successful. Not in this world. Not of this world but in Christ Jesus. Because your children, your children may not have all the money, may not have all the success. They may rebel against you sometimes. They may do things wrong, but they are successful in Christ because they believe in Jesus Christ. It doesn't say you believe in your life's gonna change. It says you believe and receive, and that's all that's required. From then on, the Spirit of God does the work. So your prayers for your children should be that they continue to walk as most highly they could in the Lord Jesus. Your prayers availeth through Christ. And you have to know that as mothers, even Jesus himself listened to his mother. So I'm telling you, the father listens when the mothers speak over their children. Amen. Can I get a hallelujah and amen this morning? <laughs> amen. So from this day forward, trust your moms, love your moms, appreciate your moms, and know that through Christ Jesus, we can do all things and be successful only in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Can you give God a round of applause in the house this morning?